Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me here on my very first Periscope broadcast. For those that don't know me, I am Craig Considine, and I'm a sociologist here in Houston, Texas, and I'm based at Rice University. So as an academic, as a interfaith activist, as an intellectual, I focus on, I think, three major subjects. One is Islam and Muslims in America. The other is race and ethnic relations. And then the third is sociology of religion with a particular focus on uh, Christian Muslim relations. So this first Periscope broadcast today is going to focus on the issue of Islamophobia and specifically how Islamophobia can be understood as a form of racism. So the reason why I'm finally launching my first Periscope, Periscope broadcast is because of a few things that developed yesterday. So I was on Twitter around two o'clock in the afternoon and I realized that there was a hashtag going on. And the hashtag was, you are a racist if. So that immediately caught my attention and I tweeted out uh, two tweets. The first one, was hashtag you are racist if you somehow think Islamophobia is a legitimate form of criticism rather than outright racism. So that was my first comment. And my second comment or tweet is hashtag you are a racist if you say something like, quote, I like Islam, I've read the Quran, I have Muslim friends, but that but is the creeping racism. So that was my tweet. It's this idea when someone might say, you know, I have black friends, um, but etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the but is always something that we need to be careful about because the but is the slow road down to a type of discrimination, a type of bigotry, and what I'm going to argue today um, is this notion of Islamophobia as racism. So the, t the title of this little lecture, I suppose, is Muslims aren't a race, so I can't be racist, right? And my argument is, no, you're wrong. Just because Muslims aren't a race doesn't mean you can't be racist if you're bashing Islam or bashing Muslims. So these two tweets yesterday got um, a lot of people riled up on the Twitterverse. There was this one individual who runs a radio program and he got wind of one of my tweets and he has 250,000 followers and he tweets something ridiculous, and all of a sudden, from 2 p.m. until 2 a.m. yesterday, my Twitter mention box was completely filled with some, some crazy tweets. Some of it was supportive of my message and people understanding my goal, but a lot of the people thought that I was a complete idiot. And to highlight this, I want to read you two emails that I've received today, just to give you an idea of where other people are coming from here in this argument of Islamophobia and racism. So the first one was from an individual named David Smith. Okay, So David Smith says to me, um, and I apologize for the poor language here. There's a lot of poor language. Um, he said that you are one ignorant individual I just checked out your Twitter. I am amazed that a, quote, doctor can be so stupid. I pity the poor fuckers that you teach. 
they will walk out into the real world and realize Islam is a cancer. That's coming from David Smith, and that was an email that I received. Now, the second email that I received, uh, the language is much worse. So put on your earmuffs if you have to. So this one reads, do the world a favor and kill yourself, in caps, kill yourself, exclamation point. You're completely brain dead and sick in the head, you sick fuck, you filthy hypocrite racist. Muslim is not a race. You act as if white Muslims don't exist, making you the racist brain dead asshole. This individual goes on and says, Islamophobia does not exist, fucktard. He says, Islam equals hate, death, violence, racism, women hate, Jew hate, gay hate, etc. And you fucking know it. He ends up by saying, and I'll wrap this up quickly, he said, stop sticking your fucked hard head in the sand. I don't give a fuck about race, but I hate Muslims like everyone with a brain, not because of a race, but because of their sick fuck hate cult called religion, fucking fairy tales. What the fuck is wrong with you? Okay, so clearly people are riled up, people are upset, and people are not understanding where I'm coming from in terms of this argument that Islamophobia should be understood as, as racism, and it actually must be understood as racism if we are serious about combating this new cancer that we see coming up in American society and the world. Okay, so that's a bit of background in terms of why I'm launching this first broadcast. Now, I'm going to give you an overview now of an article that I wrote a couple months ago for the Huffington Post, and this is going back to the title of this podcast, this broadcast. It's Muslims Aren't a Race, So I Can't Be Racist, Right, Wrong. So what I'm trying to do here is to show you a different way of looking at not only the term Islamophobia, but also the terms race and racism. Okay, we need to, ultimately, we need to move beyond this idea, this old idea, that the term race is simply something connected to your biology or your genetics or the way you look. That's certainly an important part of it, but modern racism is more complex than that, okay? So when I tell people Islamophobia is racism, one of the first things that they say is absolute um, nonsense, right? Um, as you can see through these emails um, that I received, and if you look at my my Twitter page, you'll, you'll notice that people just aren't buying this, um, this argument. So the argument people are saying Muslims are not a race, so how the hell can I even be racist, right? And then they're, they go on and say, you're an idiot, and so on. So because Muslims are not a race, people believe that any type of violence or oppression directed towards Muslims cannot somehow be racially motivated, right? that this form of hatred that we know as Islamophobia somehow cannot be racism, right? So it's this idea that I can bash Muslims and I can hate Muslims because Muslims are not a race. They follow an ideology, right? So that is the foundation on which this whole entire thing um, rests. So. Let me be clear as well that obviously I, I understand and I'm sure you all understand that Muslims are not a race, okay? That's quite obvious. The word Muslim itself connects to the, the other term Islam, right? Which is a religion, not a race. This is not rocket science. Uh, we know that Islam is not a monolith. We know that Muslims are a diverse religious grouping. Uh, in fact, it's one of the most heterogeneous populations, religious populations in the entire world. You have people of all different races and ethnicities um, following, following underneath this umbrella term of Muslim. Right? So the, the Ummah, the global Muslim community, is made up of 
many races. And I put this word in quotes because I'm going to return to this. Right? And then we also have this issue to push back against the Muslims are a race thing is that you can also convert to Islam. Right? So some people are born into the faith, but some people are born white, some people are born black. Sometimes Islam is a choice, right? So you can convert to Islam, which also goes against this idea that Muslims are a race and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can become Muslim through conversion. So in this sense, Muslim identity is nurtured, it's not natured, um, and so on and so forth. So now that we've established this issue, we have to move on to another big question that if Muslims aren't a race, then which group is a race? Okay, so in uh, American society, we have a history of seeing things in a binary, black, white, you know, black people, white people, and then other people kind of fit somewhere in between. We don't know how to categorize them and so on and so forth. So a lot of people will say, okay, black people, definitely a race, or white people, definitely a race. And people say, look at their skin color. You can see that they're white. You can see that they're black. Or you can see that someone's brown. Right? But we need to be careful here. Are black people really a race? Are white people really a race? What happens when you have uh, biracial identities? Say someone like Tiger Woods. His father's black and his mother is I believe from Southeast Asia. So is he is he black? Is he half black? Is he part of a racial black group? What's going on? That is kind of the big question. That's where I'm going here. So arguably, arguably, black people, white people, brown people, we're not really dealing with these concrete um, categories. It's a lot messier than that. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot messier than that. So another group that a lot of people like to turn to is, say, uh, Jews. Jews are a race, right? And this is bringing, back to, bringing us into anti-Semitism, that people hate Jews because not simply because of Judaism, but because of who they are. And Hitler did a lot of this genetic stuff saying that Jews are, are somewhat uh, inherently genetically inferior and all this stuff. So Hitler created the Jews as a race. But again, the Jews are a complicated social grouping, right? You have Jews that have converted into Judaism. You have Ashkenazi Jews. You have Sephardic Jews. You have someone like Sammy Davis Jr., a former musician in the United States who's African American. He's black, and he converted to Judaism, so is he a Jew? What happens to these categories when we start recognizing that these categories are not monolithic? Right. So arguably, Jews aren't a race, black people aren't a race, white people aren't a race, Asian people, no, not a race. Right. The U.S. Census says that Asians are a particular grouping, but underneath that umbrella of Asian, you have you have Japanese, Chinese, Taiwanese, Philippine, uh, people from Philippines, uh, Pakistanis, Indians, Afghans. The term Asian is not a racial category either. Okay, so what does this all mean? We've, we've just uh, gone over a bunch of racial groupings. I think the important thing to take away here is, and, and, go with me here with this argument is that there's no such thing as race traditionally understood meaning skin color genetics biology and so on and so forth and this idea that there's no such thing as race has been proven by scientists in the 20th and increasingly in the 21st century and the scientists have long ago established this idea, and this is very important, that race is not a biological reality. Race, that term, is a myth. It is socially constructed. Race is not a biological reality. Race is a socially constructed concept. And you can look 
at an example like the U.S. Census. The U.S. Census has created different types of racial categories throughout its history. So it's basically government, state representatives, and politicians creating racial categories that box people into certain identity types. Race is a socially constructed concept. But despite this fact, this, this idea, this fact that races don't really exist, and that race is a socially constructed concept, race still exists because people have been programmed to associate specific things with certain racial groups. Okay, so this idea that Asian people are somehow more intelligent or black people are somehow more athletic. Okay, or white people are more prone to be hard workers. So it's this idea that something's in their DNA that makes them tick differently. Okay, so people think people buy into these things. People buy into these realities. Right, so it's this idea race is not a biological reality. It's a socially constructed concept, yet race still exists because people have been programmed to think that certain racial groups have certain features and characteristics. Okay, so now let me provide you with a bit of, uh, a bit more of theory before I get into specifically our topic of Islamophobia. So according to Stuart Hall, the great um, British academic who passed away, unfortunately, uh, a few years ago, he called race a floating signifier, okay, a floating signifier. And by that, he, he, mean, he meant that race is a fluid concept which has specific connotations during certain moments in history. So it's this idea it floats, it changes, it's fluid. It's shape alters. It's this, again, this idea that race is a socially constructed um, concept. So races have never been biologically determined, but rather they're politically constructed. They're socially constructed by powerful people. Sometimes it's politicians, sometimes it's religious leaders, but usually it's the dominant groups in society. Now, Hall, in addition to floating signifier, introduces this term called cultural racism. And this is at the heart of my broadcast today. This idea of uh, the new racism that we see around the world today is not the old biological racism that scientists have proven to not exist anymore, but the cultural racism is the new form of racism. That's my focus here. So Stuart Hall is arguing that racism is no longer about race. It's no longer about skin color. But race, racism is about culture. So it's this idea that some people come from superior cultures and some people come from inferior cultures. And because you have this binary of superior and inferior, you start looking at people as being superior and inferior, okay? And that's when racism as understood, as understood as discrimination, as understood as xenophobia and bigotry and exclusion and othering, that's where, that's where this comes in. So we're not talking about skin color necessarily anymore. We're not talking necessarily about phenotypes. We're talking about this idea that some people are coming from imagined cultures, that they're coming from, um, different areas of the world that have a different way of life and it it freaks people out. So cultural racism cultural racism happens when certain people perceive their beliefs and customs to be culturally superior to the beliefs and customs of of others. So how this plays out in terms of Islamophobia, it's again this creation of the binary, the west versus Islam. The west western culture is superior. Islamic culture, and I put it in quotes because obviously Islam is not a monolith, but Islamic culture is seen as the other. It's seen as inferior, right? So the ideology of Western culture is perceived by people to be superior because it gives freedoms, it gives rights to women. It's not as harsh against homosexuals. Um, you have separation of church and state and so on and so forth. And then the other, which is Islam, the Islamic culture, is seen as inferior. And it's not only 
it's not only not seen as a religion, but Islam is seen as an ideology, right? So it's automatically painting Muslims as some, some type of uh, grouping that is brainwashed, that they automatically think differently, their brains think differently because they believe in uh, the Islamic tradition. Now, in addition to Stuart Hall, you have Bobby Saeed. Bobby Saeed is another excellent academic, which I suggest you all read. And if you would like me to send you some of his documents, just send me an email. So Bobby Saeed is arguing like I am that Islamophobia is undoubtedly racism. And he's regarding it as a type, and this is a quote, a type of racism that takes up the white man's burden for the new American century. It is a humanitarian interve uh, intervention. And he says that Islamophobia only wants to spread democracy, not to expropriate resources. It does not want to exterminate ignoble savages, only to domesticate unruly Muslims. Okay, so again, it's this idea that somehow, like, people actually think that Muslims need to be domesticated, that they're somehow unruly, that their actual physical being, what, what they are inside their hearts and their minds, which is their body, which is linked to racism, is somehow inferior. And it's upon the white man, the Western culture, to go out and to sometimes either, to the extreme case, eradicate this idea or somehow tame it. And you saw this taming play out in the illegal invasions, the absolutely awful invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, right? So it's this idea of promoting democracy, liberating Muslims because they're somehow inferior. Their culture is inferior. Their ideology is inferior, right? So you have the same type of process that racism has. A hundred years ago in this country, some people in certain states of the United States looked at someone and said they are black. They are somehow this. Or they looked at a white person and said, okay, this white person is somehow this. And their actions were determined by how they looked, how they appeared. We see the same thing playing out now with Islamophobia. That people are connecting certain ideas to do with Islam and Muslims largely through what people see with their eyes, something like a beard, or a certain clothing that someone wears that may identify them as, as Muslim, and then automatically people other them and say they are Muslim, they are inferior, right? So we see racism is, is changing. It's no longer that biological racism. It's that cultural, that cultural racism, which is what Hall is talking about. Now, there is a, another term that Bobby Saeed uses, and that is that Muslims have been depicted in the public discourse, especially in America and Europe, as the arch villains, right? So if we run through American history quite quickly, this could take forever, but we talk about the history of racism in the United States, okay? It started arguably with the Native Americans. They were seen as an inferior race, an inferior culture. Then it moved on to Catholics, and then it moved on to Jews, and uh, Hispanics, and Blacks, and now we have Muslims. Muslims are the arch, the arch villains, largely as a result from 9-11, um, right? They became a lot more visible, and now they're the, they're the arch villains. In the 60s, you had the communists, and now you have the, the arch villains, which are the Muslims. And Saeed is arguing that this depiction in the public discourse of Muslims as arch villains creates racist anxieties in the minds of non-Muslim people, okay? So a depiction like what a terrorist is. After 9-11, Osama bin Laden's face was everywhere, okay? Look at the depiction of, of so-called terrorists, and I'm talking physical depiction of so-called terrorists in Hollywood movies and TV shows and so on and so forth. What does a terrorist generally look like? I would love to see some data on this, but largely probably going to be brown, probably going to have a Middle Eastern name, probably going to have a beard, probably going to be angry, probably going to be Arab. That's called playing off racist anxieties, right? So when people are traveling in airports, 
they see certain people fitting this depiction that has been created through the public discourse, right? Again, going back to this idea that race is a socially constructed concept. It doesn't necessarily have to be about biology. It's about how people look, how you categorize people into different cultures, and so on and so forth, right? So Saeed, in, in, on top of this idea of the arch villain and the racist anxiety, also says that um, Islamophobia then is, or discrimination against Muslims is somehow justified as a rational response. Okay, so it's this idea that we have to be Islamophobic because they are trying to kill us. Muslims are trying to kill us, therefore we can discriminate against Muslims or we can hate Islam, right? And that's obviously problematic because it assumes that Islam is a, is a monolith which is one of the basic underlying principles of, of Islamophobia. Now, to be clear, there's really nothing rational about Islamophobia. To hate Islam, a religion, which can be interpreted thousands of different ways. There's nothing rational about hating Muslims. Because, one, it's ridiculous to hate really hate another human being, but again, Muslims are not a monolithic uh, group. So to treat Muslims poorly is nothing short of racism. How could it be anything different? We've established the fact that the term race is a socially constructed concept. It has changed throughout history, that we are entering into a new period where race is a it should be understood as a, a form of cultural racism, that people are discriminated against because of what they believe in, how they dress, what country they come from, what traditions they follow. So that, that is racism. It's that simple, right? So if you give a woman a dirty look, and if that Muslim woman is wearing a hijab, and you give her a dirty look, I think that's racism because you are looking at someone's body and you're looking at someone's preference and way of life and you're saying that that is backward or that is inferior. To me, that uh, is racism. Now, I'm almost done. I also want to say that, and I tell my students this all the time, Islamophobia is so real and Islamophobia to me is so clearly racial and racist that even Sikhs have suffered the brunt of anti-Muslim sentiment. Okay, so again, this goes to the idea of how do people look? What do people wear? That's what triggers the racist anxiety. So in 2015 in September, in the suburbs of Chicago, there was a man named Inderjeet Singh Mukher, and he was followed in his car. He was tailed by a man. Um, Mr. Mukher got to a stoplight. The man pulled up in his car right next to Mukher's car, dragged Mukher out of the car, uh, beat the crap out of him. And this man was saying, um, when he was detained and brought to the police station, he said that he beat up Mucker because he looked like a Muslim, and he also called Mucker a terrorist, and he called him bin Laden. Okay? So this man, this criminal that beat up Mucker, had an idea in his head of what a Muslim looks like. He looked at Mucker's body, and he said he immediately categorized him, and then all of these ideas about the category of being Muslim came into being. You know, terrorism, 9-11, ISIS, blah, 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 Sharia, blah, blah, blah. And then boom, he acts on it. Um, so this is interesting. Eduardo Bonilla Silva, another sociologist, basically is arguing that this, this cultural racism that I'm talking about is a racism without race. Right? We've, we've established and scientists have established the fact that this idea of race is not, it's not real. It's a fluid concept. It's always been used to categorize people, but human beings are a messy 
group of people. No one is pure. No one is solid, right? Um, so we, we need to be very, very careful with how we look at, the, at, at this term racism, especially when race, that term race, really doesn't really have any beef behind it outside of the fact that it exists because people think it exists. Okay, so the more we assume, to wrap this up, the more we assume that race is limited to just skin color, the less we are going to really be able to understand this contemporary form of racism that Muslims face at home and abroad. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain that again. The more we assume that race is limited only to skin color and that racism is limited to only skin color, the less we are going to be able to understand of this contemporary phenomena known as Islamophobia and the type of experiences that Muslims at home and abroad face. So now is really the time, and you can share this podcast, now is the time to push the boundary of our understanding of not only Islamophobia, but also uh, racism. And I think we need to teach the youth, especially, um, you know, I don't know, starting maybe at 10 years old or um, in middle school, that Islamophobia is racism and it needs to be identified as such to actually fight it and to actually combat it. Because if we're actually saying that it's not a form of racism, then we're letting people who hate a particular group of people simply for their beliefs and the way they look, we're letting those people off the hook. And that's not good. And we can't be letting bigots and racists off the hook ever. So I hope you enjoyed my first uh, Periscope broadcast here. I hope to be doing this maybe once a week. For those who don't know me, I'm Craig Considine. I tweet at, um, at Craig, my first name, C-R-A-I-G, uh, Cons, C-O-N-S, and you can find me on Facebook, and I also blog at Dr. Craig Constantine, TCD.com. So please do follow me. I look forward to connecting with all of you. Hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Please do share it if you feel like it's worthy. Thank you and take care.